Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we'll get started here shortly, as soon as it gets to be right around 3.30. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Today we are going to be in the third uh, presentation of the second series we're doing uh, this year for Post Clover, uh, Successful Implementation of High Resistance Grounding in Data Centers. So that's what we're talking about. Hopefully that pertains to you. Um, if not, just stick around. <laughs> you will learn something anyway. Uh, one thing I do want to mention is that uh, we are going to be doing a question and answer session at the towards the end of this uh, presentation. If you have questions, uh, please put them in the, there's a question tab that you can put them in. Uh, we will go ahead and review them at the end. Uh, we do have someone that is reviewing the questions, so you may have an answer before it ends. So if, if you did, you probably, you probably won't be part of the Q&A. Um, but otherwise, uh, we'll try to do our best. And if and if we happen to miss you, if there's a lot of questions, then we'll we'll get those answers for you after the presentation. So let's go ahead and get started. So uh, about me, my name is Chris Small. I've been at Post Glover for about 12 years now. It hasn't seen it doesn't seem that long, but apparently it is. Everybody else says yes, it definitely has been that long. Has it been that short, apparently? Um, post Clover application engineer, regional sales manager, I graduated uh, electrical engineering degree from Ohio State. I did want to mention, although he probably doesn't want me to, uh, a, a special thanks to Stu Gibbon, my colleague, who has helped me a lot with this presentation. He could definitely give this presentation. Uh, he knows enough about it. Uh, I think what if if I think what he would say is, if you really like the presentation. Go ahead and give him credit for it. But if you didn't like it, just forget I ever mentioned his name. So let's go ahead and and start with. Um, oops, excuse me. Selecting components and strategies. So the overall idea uh, which, which behind grounding and data centers is to really maximize safety and reliability. Um, so just as a as a as a um, you know. Um, notice basically just as or as a caveat basically um we are experts in grounding and resistance grounding specifically uh, we know a lot about how um resistors and even data centers go together we've done a lot of application work on that um, but we are not data center experts by any stretch um, you can ask us any question you want but if you're uh, going to ask us a data center a question that doesn't have anything to do with grounding then we may not be your best your best option but anyway so the goal is to maximize safety and reliability you kind of have to combine the two um your grounding methodology has a major impact between of, of that so you, you if you're going to do a you know your, your grounding is going to kind of set the way for what kind of equipment you can use et cetera et cetera so equipment choices must consider the grounding method uh, it's just the way it is if you depending on your grounding method you're going to have to have different ratings you're going to have to have um, potentially even different equipment so keep that in mind um, you all always want to look at uh, how your optimal load sharing influences equipment ratings so uh, you know we've worked on several s systems where um, 
you know, grounding kind of comes to play towards the end when we're, we're doing a large amount of, uh, you know, in parallel systems, et cetera, and, and it drastically influences your grounding system. So all those things are important. You need to keep those in mind. So traditional grounding methods, keep it simple, solidly grounded, um, definitely more common in smaller data centers. I mean, overall, to be fair, solidly grounded is probably the more common solution. It doesn't mean it has to be, but it just, I mean, I just I think this, more people are familiar with it. Um, definitely more common in smaller data centers. Usually that's cost driven. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of times they're more modular, et cetera. Uh, resistance grounded is um, more, com more common in larger data centers. And when we say resistance ground, we really mean uh, either low or high resistance. We'll go over those definitions in a second, up to 15 kV. And usually uh, at 15 kV, we're talking for about generator protection. At 5 kV and below, it could be whole system protection. Um, although there are caveats to that, so don't hold me to that. So going over some definitions, uh, solidly ground system, let's start with that. Uh, there's some good news. So basically it's a it's a bare copper wire between neutral and ground. Um, I think most of us are very familiar with this. Um, it's very accommodating to single phase loads. Uh, it doesn't really, you, you can definitely utilize single phase loads with a solid ground system with no issues. Uh, simple ground reference. So for things that need a ground reference, uh, UPS, et cetera, it doesn't add too much complexity there. Um, high levels of ground fault current. So, you know, we talk about um, IEEE and their recommendations, and they, they talk about solid grounding, how you can have, um, you know, large levels of arc flash, arc blast, high high levels of current. Those are all true. Um, it's one of the, I, I would say solid ground systems are, um, have the most potential for arc flash overall. Um, mostly because the, the high level of ground fault current and also the likelihood the, the higher likelihood for that ground fault to escalate into a phase to phase or three phase um, capacitive charging current which i know we haven't really talked about but it's this it's this right here we'll go into the definitions here in a minute but it's not normally a consideration um, that'll make more sense later but usually the current here is so high uh, that we don't have to worry about that very much Moving forward to resistance grounding systems. Um, so the idea of a resistance grounding system is you're just inserting a resistor between neutral and ground. It's exactly the same as a solid ground system with a resistor um, in series. Um, it gives you uh, the ability to drastically decrease the amount of current that's flowing. So the current is inversely proportional to resistance. Uh, so you can basically design your ground fault current. That's very good, uh, especially for 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 applications where you want to continue continually operate. Uh, there are two different. Just before we get to the other stuff, there are two different types of resistance grounding. There's high resistance and low resistance. Uh, there is no hard and fast definitions for these. However, typically we're in the 10 amp range for resistance ground, uh, high resistance ground systems. And typically for industrial applications, data centers included, uh, at medium voltage, we're talking, you know, 100 amp, 200 amp, 400 amp in that range. Those are common values. So um, when we talk about, so for both of those, obviously much lower than potentially thousands of amps of ground fault current for solid ground systems. However, uh, you know, as you go down further, it's specifically with high resistance ground, like I mentioned, 10 amps roughly, uh, reduces arc flash hazard. Uh, you, especially at low voltage, at low voltage, just to, just to let you know, um, for a ground fault, uh, there is really no arc flash hazard. So the vast majority of all your faults are lying to ground in, in, this, in your system. And with a high resistance ground system at low voltage, you do not have the ability to create uh, an arc flash at a low voltage um, that's important uh, it does not it does not consider your phase to phase or three phase faults however i will say that you are less likely like i mentioned before in solid ground systems you're more likely to degrade into 
a larger type fault line in line three phase, you, you are less likely to in a, in a high resistance ground system. One thing you do have to worry about, however, is when we're talking about high resistance ground, which, which once again, I kind of threw out 10 amps there and it may, I may have not describe it, but essentially what 10 amps means is that you have a let through current or your fault current is designed to be 10 amps or in that range. So um, I know it's, it's sometimes weird for, especially guys who haven't heard of a uh, uh, term, term that way before, but a lot of times we define resistors in terms of current when it comes to ground fault because it's just easier to understand. If I have a 10 amp resistor, it means there's 10 amps of ground fault. So with that low level of ground fault, this can come into play. Um, it's, it could be a comparative value. We'll discuss that in a minute, but I wanted to uh, just let you know that it's definitely a design consideration for higher resistance ground systems. That being said, let's go to the first poll question. Um, we'll give you guys a minute or, or so to, to look at that and to answer. So based on the polling results, those who have used high resistance counting on data center projects have not used transformer for UPS. Okay, thank you. In case you thought I had a cold, that was actually Stu. He was he was answering that. And he will actually help us with the, the, the question and answer session as well. So let's talk about this systems capacitance. So I keep talking, I keep referring to it. I haven't really defined it yet. Um, Systems capacitance charge grid. So systems capacitance is essentially the capacitance uh, in this in this situation from line to ground. So it's uh, it's a zero sequence capacitance um, in your system, which is basically comprised of a lot of small capacitances that adds up in your system. What does that mean? So as you can see in the picture here, um, there's a capacitor. It's a pretty simple definition. We have a conductor. Basically, it's two conductors with um, an insulator in between. So that's the generic definition of a of a of a capacitor. Now, in this scenario, we're going to be talking about a phase to ground uh, capacitance. So um, usually you have a conductor, a cable tray, or some kind of ground pad, and then you have insulation in between. So things that that could mean parallel cables, motor windings, uh, those different things that have capacitance uh, that that have small levels of capacitance, those things all add up to uh, create your system's capacitance. A capacitor carries charge, it has a current associated with it. Uh, so uh, what does that mean if, for your system? So this is an ungrounded system, just to show you real quick. Here's your fault. Um, I will say, um, I, didn't, I don't have it shown here, but essentially what we're worried about is an intermittent fault. And so if you have a fault, let's think about, uh, just think about an arc fault just as an example of an intermittent fault. It doesn't have to be an arc fault, but it's as an example, think of an arc fault that opens and closes, opens and closes. Every time it closes, you're building up charge in these non-faulted phase capacitances, okay? So then you have these, you have these voltages building up. Um, in an unground system, there's nowhere for it to discharge. Uh, you don't only have an additional path. So every time that opens and closes, you're building up more and more charge, IEEE talks about how you can get six to eight times your rate of voltage. Well, if you're at, you know, let's say you're at, you know, 480 volts, or whatever, roughly 2,800, 3,000 volts, you're always going to have system-wide issues. Uh, gonna, they may not all happen at the same time, but you're going to start getting failures across your system. It can cause damage across your system. It's not a good situation to be. So that's an ungrounds. It's maybe asking yourself, why are you bringing this up? Um, the reason is because for a resistance ground system, for a high resistance ground system, if you don't have the current resistor, the, res uh, the resistor current, the, the, resist the current associated with the, the, the resistor that you put between neutral and ground, 
um, if the co system's capacitance charge current is greater than the resistor current, then you essentially have the same same thought. You have the you have it building this charge up under the same circumstances, and you're discharging, but not as fast as you're charging if, if this value is greater. So that's the idea. You're kind of if your resistor current is is less than that of the system's capacitance, then we're kind of moving towards that on-ground system scenario. You can build over voltages. You do not want that. So that is definitely a that is definitely a a design consideration you want to have, um, and uh, you you want to make sure that uh, for for low voltages uh, or for I'm sorry excuse me for medium voltage and low voltage you want to make sure you have uh, that no this is for charge current uh, we'll say under uh, for regular industrial applications. Um, Charge current is not usually that big of a deal. 40 volts, we're talking like one to two amps typically, or maybe even less. Uh, I'd be more, more I guess, diligent about it with data centers. Uh, I've seen, just from personal experience, I've seen a lot of higher charge currents, even at low voltage data centers. And it has to do with um, some components that we'll talk about later. Uh, but that's the idea. You want to you kind of avoid that. So speaking of charge current and the contribution of that data centers have, and really generally speaking, but a lot of times you use more of these components in data centers. Um, so what, what what creates charge current? Um, let's talk about surge suppressors and, and VFD. So for surge suppressors, um, there's really, it's usually comprised of, um, you know, there's a capacitor in there. There's, uh, you know, there's, there's a few different components. Sometimes a resistor, sometimes uh, some kind of uh, transistor, but we don't need to worry about that. There's a capacitor. That's what we're worried about. Um, so if you look at IEEE tables that that talk about um, estimating charge current for surge suppressors, the values that you see are kind of here. So so at 15 kV, we're talking about 2.5 amps. 5 kV, 1.4 amps, and 600 volts, 0.35 amps. So, you know, those, I guess from experience, I would say if you're going to calculate those and you don't have the value of the capacitance, zero sequence capacitance, I would say use those values, use those numbers. Um, if you do, I would you probably use um, what you have. Obviously, it's more accurate. Plus, the reason why I'm saying that is because I've seen a lot of times where if you estimate a lot, especially at 50 kV, if you estimate a long, a lot of charge current there. Uh, most of the time, when I actually get down to the, what it actually is, it's the capacitance, probably because uh, you know there's probably 30 years between that paper and the, the, these surge suppressors of today. Usually a little bit lower than, than the, they are in those papers. So, just an FYI on that. Uh, variable frequency drives. Just as a note, um, it's it's an, there's an isolation point from the system typically. So you're going to have either through isolation transformer or just even by going uh, changing uh, DC AC or AC DC AC typically um, you're going to have some isolation there so you have to understand it affects both the charging current and protection so um, a lot of times you're going to have uh, you know a motor behind that and you may not uh, you may not have to, to really include that because of the isolation there um, another note that doesn't really have to do with uh, charge current but I thought I should bring it up uh, for variable frequency drives um, it just as a general note with with resistance grinding systems, um, a lot of times there's like there's uh, over voltage protection in the drive, and uh, it's uh, basically a ground path that is uh, solidly grounded essentially. And so what you're doing when you have that activated is you are essentially paralleling a solid ground system and a resistance ground system. So in that scenario, I think you most of you know that the solid ground system is going to win. The vast majority of the current is going to flow through there. That means it's going to flow through your drive. That means you're not going to have a drive for very long. So just as, a, as an aside, I understand that, but I just want to mention that because that's something that comes up from time to time. Um, there usually is a jumper there that you can uh, you can remove, and that way you can not have to worry about it. Uh, next, we talk about harmonic filters. Uh, I've seen this happen more as you know you get more you know obviously it's, it's for a from an efficiency standpoint it's good to have clean power um, you might need to use harmonic filters for that purpose um, there's typically 
you know, a lot of times you think of either uh, a motor uh, or something like basically a, a VFD, uh, like a line filter, or like these bigger filters that kind of do your, your entire system. Uh, once again, using because of the drives, depending on if you have like a line side VF, uh, filter, you may have to include that in charge current. But typically what I'm talking about is really this system-wide uh, filter where you're going to have a, a decent amount of capacitance to ground. Um, so you need to you need to consider that. So one thing I wanted to show you this formula just uh, real quickly. This is essentially for a lot of your different components uh, how you can calculate your uh, your contributing uh, uh, charge current. And so basically, we, I think we see this two, two times squared three, obviously pi line line voltage frequency, then zero sequence capacitance. So really, the only unknown here is your zero sequence capacitance. And so as soon as you figure that out, you can figure out what what your contribution is. Um, other potential equipment with similar effect in terms of uh, adding a, a decent amount of charge current, phase crush capacitors, snubbers. Um, I will say for for um, for stuff things like surge suppressors, phase crush capacitors, there's always the option of hooking them up delta. Um, I don't believe you can do that with snubbers. I'm not don't don't quote me on that, but I don't I don't I don't know I don't think of a can't think of an application where you would could do that. But essentially, you could hook, hook those up delta, and therefore that would obviously not have a zero sequence capacitance, uh, and then you wouldn't have to worry about that contribution. Otherwise, if you hook it up to uh, as a zero sequence, then you're going to, uh, or is it, I should say a Y either way, um, you're going to have that problem. And of course, there is UPS. Um, UPS is a, I would say, is the main reason, just as just as a note, made the main reason why data centers are um, a unique challenge for um, high resistance ground i think we definitely obviously well if you if you're familiar with with a lot of large data centers you know it's very popular uh to do high resistance ground so i'm not saying it can't be done but there's definitely some considerations some challenges and this is the main reason why in my opinion um so typically just historically speaking just from my experience we're talking you know a couple amps maybe for a ups system on charge current uh some newer models like i mentioned uh or I didn't mention some newer models that we've seen recently uh, can be really high. Uh, 8.5 amps is the highest I've seen. That's really high. Obviously, I, I mentioned before, 10 amps um, is kind of your what your range is, or at least what what we typically see for high resistance ground. So you want to kind of be careful with that. Now, I will say in this in this situation, um, we still used. Uh, a high resistance ground system. The rest of the system was very low, like one, a little less than one and a half amps. Uh, so we used uh, a 10 amp resistor on there. Anyway, but I just want to let you know, especially if you have newer eight, uh, UPSs, you may want to look into that because uh, I honestly don't know why uh, this one in particular yet, at least, was that high, or if all the newer ones are that high, I, we haven't figured. We're talking brand new stuff here, probably the last couple months. So, I will get to the we will get to the bottom of that. But once again, you can still use resistance grounding. You just need to be careful of that contribution. I just want to mention cable because traditionally, and for, for any application, almost always cable is the largest contributor. I would say for data centers, that's probably not the case. Uh, just just from all the other stuff I mentioned previously, but I did want to, to mention it. Now, one, one thing I will say is that it's also the easiest to calculate and to estimate. Basically, just take your um, there's a formula for it. We're not going to this isn't really a charge current uh, uh, calculation uh, uh, webinar, so we're not going to go over how you do it. But there is a pretty easy uh, calculation you can do based off of the diameter of the conductor versus the the insulator, et cetera. But those are the, the main contribute contributors. So let's move on to uh, UPS types. Uh, I just wanted to mention uh, some, uh, once again, we're not really uh, UPS experts, but you just wanted to kind of mention the different ones you use. Uh, there's obviously a difference between rotary and static. Those are the two main types. All that really means is rotary inside the electrical uh, 
portion of the unit, basically in the circuit, you're going to have a, a moving moving in or moving part essentially. And so those are those two categories: a front loader generator, battery UPS, and then the engine coupled UPS. I would say those are tip. Those are um, popular for larger data centers. Uh, they typically have a largest uh, support for like your load uh, in terms of you know you could have over a megawatt for your engine coupled UPS, for example. Um, it's kind of a I don't need to give you a history lesson, but basically you had rotary being pretty popular for a while and then static kind of completely took over because just because of the the um, the efficiency and the maintenance issues. They're, they're, they're less maintenance and they're also more efficient. Uh, from my understanding, rotary is making a comeback. So they're, they're becoming more efficient, but that's not for this uh, we're not going to talk about that in detail today. I uh, will say the double conversion UPS on the static side is the most popular type of, of UPS used. Um, you know, it's, it's a large portion. I don't want to say exact numbers because uh, I think it used to be 90%, but that may be, you know, I'm, I, that's a few years ago. So I don't know if I'm keeping up with, with, with how much uh, what, what UPS are used. Flywheel UPS, just to mention, um, you know, it's not not very it's not very common. It's about three percent, uh, roughly, maybe more now, uh, but, that, but it's a small percentage. Uh, just as a note, uh, you may think, why is flywheel UPS on the static column there? Uh, essentially, it's used for storage. So we're not talking about part of the actual uh, circuit. So uh, it's actually considered static. So we go on to. UPS is with a transformer and without a transformer. So first we'll talk about the ones with the transformer. So, you know, over the last 15 years, I would say probably started roughly 15 years ago, maybe, you know, maybe just started getting popular that way. Uh, but from what I can tell, about 15 years ago, it started to become popular to use resistance ground, high resistance ground. And use, what you would do is you'd use it with a transformer You'd have your separate ground, you'd have your separate uh, HRG ground, and you wouldn't really have to worry about a ground reference on your UPS because you have this all this isolation here. So you have this isolation on both sides. Um, you don't really have to worry about uh, compatibility because your uh, your resistance grounding system is separately grounded, uh, and that's the easiest way to, to to use HRG with UPS. And it still is. It still is, although. Um, I would say transformer-based UPSs are becoming less popular because when you have windings, you're gonna have you know you're gonna be losing power. You have winding losses. So um, if you you know if you if you're not worried about that, just worry about ease of use. I would still say that uh, this is the easier UPS to work with the uh, HRG. Let me go into the transformer-free type. Um, so you don't really need uh, anymore the isolation transformers. This is this is uh, once again, like I mentioned again, this is popular because of the the, the better efficiency. Um, so this is where we've kind of come up with or, or come into some issues uh, historically, uh, where we're trying to figure out how to ground uh, or have a ground reference for the UPS, which typically it needs, and then also have a you know obviously an HRG ground. Uh, the only only way that I know that I'm aware of, uh, so the UPS doesn't need an actual ground. It really just needs to have a uh, basically a a a stabilizing tire. We call it center point, which is I think which is kind of com a common term. But essentially, all we need to worry about is the UPS um, not changing voltages or not having a floating voltage. Um, and so when we have that center tie, um, we are stabilizing that voltage. So therefore, when you go to bypass, you operate under the same the same voltage. So you know, otherwise, if you didn't have that, you're just floating. You would have a different voltage. That's not a good situation. So you can do you can do. I guess the bottom line is you can do high resistance ground with transformer free UPS if they UPS has a means to stabilize the voltage without actually uh, having a competing ground with HRG. 
And so this is definitely it. This is, so I'm, I'm not telling you that every UPS train somewhere free can be utilized at HRGU. I'm saying is that there are, there are uh, at least a few that I know of, and I'm, I'm guessing that by this point there's more uh, to, that you can actually use that has some kind of a reference point so that you you don't have to worry about that floating voltage for the UPS. So in terms of design considerations, uh, once again, not all US PS topologies are compatible with HRG. Um, I would just, it really it's not that, not that complicated in terms of the fact that your vendor is gonna know whether or not, I mean, of all the vendors I can think of have done testing with HRG, they know their system and they, they design it. Um, you know, they have ones that they designed for not HRG and they either can use the same ones for HRG or they have a, a, a completely different one that they use for HRG. So usually if you just talk to your UPS vendor, then you would, you would make that differentiation. Uh, I've kind of mentioned this already, but potential concerns, the large capacitive charge current contribution, I'm not going to, you know, not going to deliver that again, but you know, 8.5 amps uh, is the largest I've seen. That's a, that's, that's pretty large. Uh, well, another note. Um, so we actually have a charge current measuring feature, which I, this isn't a commercial presentation, but this is more of a technical point. Um, sometimes uh, the noise back feed in, uh, of the of the UPS is is so, is so great that it causes interference with our measurement feature. So if you have an HRG, I guess really our HRG, I don't think anybody else measures the charge current, but if you have our HRG, uh, we recommend that you would actually turn off the UPS, not necessarily disconnect, but just power down. And usually you can get accurate. Uh, uh, you should be able to get an accurate measurement based on that. Uh, we've, uh, I've done about a few hundred, uh, probably a couple hundred uh, HRGs in the field. Um, several of those I've done with UPSs. Um, doesn't, there's not always an issue, but I've ran into a lot of them where you know, as soon as I turned that UPS off, it was good to go. But you can get inflated values. But essentially, you get like you know, 12, 12 amps. And you're like, what? why is it so high? But, um, but usually, you can make a differentiation between real real capacitive charge current and uh, just noise uh, with, by doing that. So let's move on to the second and final poll question. Uh, we'll go ahead and do that right now. And it would appear, Chris, as though maybe we've dialed in a little too closely on our poll questions. As I'm, I'm wondering, based on the results, there's a very small percentage who either say yes or no to having issues with the transformer feed for UPS and HRG, and many who simply said we don't have experience with that. Okay. Well, the good news is, you know, if you if you can you can utilize the knowledge now. It's it's a uh, it's one of those things where you have to. Uh, you have to be careful when you're when you're uh, designing your your system. So if you guys, I, I'm assuming if you're here, you're interested and or you are involved with data center design, um, or at least just data centers, um, and uh, so that's going to be some knowledge that you can use moving forward. Uh, so commute, cumulative effects of loads of loads. Basically, you have each component being fed uh, from the same source. So really. Just to make it simple, uh, let's say you have a 5 kV uh, transformer. Uh, there's it's, there's loads across the 5 kV side. Then you go step down from from a 5 a 5 kV to 40 uh, volt transformer. So really everything in between. Assuming there's no isolation. Once again, I kind of made some caveats like maybe a drop, maybe a VFD could cause some isolation, or maybe have multiple transformers, etc. But from basically from isolation point to isolation point, everything in between is con contributes to the charge current. And if you guys are more, from, if you guys are really interested in in learning about how to um, 
do a uh, capacitive charge current and uh, measurement, uh, calculation, et cetera. Uh, we can, there's some papers we can share. Just go ahead and contact us and we'll, we'll get you some stuff. Uh, we may end up doing a, a webinar on it specifically. We've done it. We've done, we've kind of done a lot of presentations where we've, we've hit on it, but we haven't really done one specifically catered to that. Uh, I don't think yet. Um, anyway, so, uh, Emergency switching protocols may add considerable contributions. Basically, think about what you, what you what you want to accomplish and how you know. Uh, kind of worst case scenario may, may may kind of fall into this as well, where you have several sources. Uh, you have you know your load system, the load profile, and what's your worst case scenario going to look like? Are you going to you going to you going to power your entire uh, profile with one source? You know, uh, if that's the case, you're going to have essentially five times, let's just say there's five transformers, five times the, the load and the capacitive charge current associated with that. So essentially, the larger your capacitive charge current is, the larger your resistor is going to have to be. Um, if you if that is you, the way you want to do it, then your resistor is going to be, at least in terms of necessity, about five times what it would, what it would have had to been. So. Um, not necessarily a problem, but it could drive your resistor up to 10 amps, 12 amps, potentially above that, uh, which we've seen before. Uh, is if your system can handle that, okay. Um, well, we we've, we've seen some very uh, high-profile you know, data centers, I should say, um, using a large amount of charge current and a large amount of a large large resistor. So it's not it's not it's not, not that you can't do it. You need to make sure that your system can handle it. So grounding of parallel sources, uh, just just good, this is good to know uh, when we're talking about ATS or even just you know normal transfer switch. When you have two different uh, two different sources and you're trying to service the same uh, the same load, essentially there's a few different ways you can do this. Um, the first option is you could have a a, a bus attached uh, resistor. Uh, we're talking about three phase uh, neutral grinding resistor. So we're, you know, typically uh, we're talking about a neutral driving transformer that goes along with that. So you have a, let's just say a zigzag or a, you know, just a, some kind of neutral driving transformer configuration uh, tied with your HRG. Uh, and so you could you, you could be protected that way. The problem with that scenario is that your emer your emergency generator typically likes to synchronize uh, wind up essentially before it goes online so in this scenario you can tell that there's nothing to the, with the generator in terms of grounding um, so we're going to be winding up and grounded that's not necessarily how it it's not ideal i guess i should say so some people i've seen it happen this has been done before some people don't mind this but that is definitely the negative when you when you're talking about this type of, uh, of, of uh, configuration the most, in my opinion, the most common configuration, what I would personally recommend is you'd have um, you have a resistance ground at, at each source. So uh, no matter what source you, you're going to, uh, you're always resistance grounded. You don't have to really worry about it. Um, it's kind of cut and dry. I, I'm, it's also the most expensive, but still, it's all you know. That's the negative, but it's it's by far the most. Uh, I guess should say the, the cleanest solution. If you're looking for an alternate solution, uh, you, you could actually, because the emergency generator uh, really just has uh, very little capacitive charging current. It's almost, it's almost zero. It's not quite zero, but it's very low here. Um, you can just do like a, essentially a resistor only package here with some kind of a, a, a simple, uh, you know, a CT with some kind of into a relay, something very simple to, to notify you of a fault. Give your normal HRG here. Um, so you're, you know, you're you're saving money uh, doing it this way. I don't know if there's really any benefits besides that. Um, I would still recommend the the the, the, the both the, both uh, uh, I can't think the generator and the, <laughs> the generator and the transformer. Both sources, there we go, there's the word I was missing. Um, so um, I would recommend that. 
I will say this just as a, as an aside. Um, I've been asked this probably at least 30 times. Can you use one resistor for both sources um, beside, up, up towards the sources, not actually on the secondary side of the transfer switch, but up here? The only way you can do that, and I don't necessarily would re not necessarily recommend it, is you have to have a, a three-pole switch, and you'd have to have a, a non-separately derived system, and that requires a bunch of labeling. It requires a bunch of different things you have to do per NEC. And also note that you cannot do any maintenance on this on this work on this uh, system unless the entire system shut down. So that's those are the negatives of that. But those are all possibilities. I just wanted to mention that because once again it comes up a lot. I think clients are probably you know sometimes they're looking at for a low cost solution, and so that might be where that comes up. But once again, both sources where, where I recommend to go. Um, I kind of. Uh, I kind of got ahead of myself in terms of mentioning the uh, the the the, the, uh, the three pole versus four pole, but essentially this is how that this looks. You have obviously with the four pole, you're going to have a new neutral involved as well. Um, you know, you're switching the neutral, so that makes everything nice and clean. And you have the multiple uh, multiple protection uh, scenarios there with HRG, or you can pick which one you want actually, but typically it would be both HRG. Um, but and then, but if you had three pole, once again, you're not uh, you're not separating sources. Therefore, you're not actually even though your generator is off, you don't your neutral is still tied to the transformer. So therefore, you don't want to be working on that generator while that transformer is live. So that's the idea there. Moving on to a very popular design for really a lot of different things, but data centers included in that. Um, you have your main tie main, uh, and there's sometimes you, get, you can get, you know, to where you have multiple ties, you know, uh, across and then multiple tra parallel transformers. But this is a simple uh, double ended uh, switch gear where you have um, your two sources. Obviously, you have your circuit breakers um, at the sources and also uh, between the loads. And so you, you have the capability of, you know, operating independently of each other, which is, you know, can be standard, or you can operate the entire load's profile with one source, et cetera. So this is kind of how it works. Um, we recommend having, again, having two uh, resistors, HRGs on each side. Um, it's, 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 it's just a lot cleaner that way. Well, it gives you the flexibility of actually doing whatever you want in terms of tie breaking, et cetera, opening stuff up. Um, you know, if you have, if you're operating everything under one source, understand that you're going to have a larger amount of charge current. You don't need to put that in your design, your design considerations. Uh, usually, you have a, a closed transition for data centers. In, in my experience, uh, typically you don't want to really have that interruption. Uh, uh, so you're going to be uh, temporarily paralleled. Uh, it's not an issue except for the fact that you want to have some kind of uh, some kind of uh, me mechanism in place that if you have a fault on the system, you don't want, don't want to allow that to, to switch over. That can cause some issues. Um, in terms of grounding protocols, uh, we're not really going to talk about these in detail. That would take way too long. Um, but it's a good reference, just the list of uh, different days. It's, there's a, the list is a little bit longer than your typical uh, um, application. Uh, just really for safety purposes. Um, as you can see there, the standards are typically recommendations, codes are essentially, you know, you need to do that. So uh, just this is a good, it's, uh, in my opinion, a good reference. If you want to go back and kind of see what you, uh, see what these are all about, um, please do. So designing to maximize HRG benefits, select equipment compatible with HRG. We talked about UPS, how some are and some aren't. Uh, once again, it's pretty simple. You're going to just be looking at you, towards your vendor for some assistance there. Um, can this UPS be used with HRG? How do we hook it up? Is there a center point? Is there a center point reference I can use with it? Um, do I need to isolate it? You know, what are the things you need to do? They typically would have those answers uh, depending on which UPS you use. Uh, use feeder identification when possible. Uh, this is, I think, a good practice for uh, for identifying the, identifying the fault uh, as fast as possible. Um, typically, with data centers, we're looking for uh, redundancy. 
and the ability to operate as cleanly as possible, you're going to have, if you can identify that feeder that defaults on, you can maybe even shut down that feeder, or you can switch over to an alternate source. Um, it just it just depends on depending on the application. You really want to use it. Really, just kind of gives you more flexibility. Do you to either shut down the whole system or not or not necessarily? So, um, avoid it's kind of to the same point. Avoid excessive loading of, of you know substations. We've talked about it before. Um, just be careful the way you design your system so that you um, you may have to use a large amount of, of, of resistance current uh, where you might not want to uh, if your system can't if you have a emergency if you have a, uh, a, a a emergency situation where you have one transformer off of the off of the five sets of loads you're going to have a lot of a lot of charge current a high, a high level of resist of uh, current excuse me charge current and therefore you need a high level you know 10 amp 12 amp 15 amp resistor can your system um, handle that and do you really want that to be part of the system once again it's doable we have we have uh, systems that do that right now but um you know the, the, the higher the current the worse it may be in terms of uh specifying equipment and being able to operate continuously uh coordinated info across network devices kind of goes along with the same thing make sure that everything's coordinated You're, you you know what's you know what's happening uh you know a lot of times we have uh for, mo for most of our standard equipment HRG, we have uh, digital communications, so you can coordinate all across your network, knowing when your faults are, uh, where they are, uh, potentially where the, the feeders are, et cetera. Which, which fault the feeders on? Which feeder the faults on? Right. So in conclusion, um, high resistance grounding drastically reduces downtime. Um, it, it's, it really is, uh, uh, if I didn't emphasize it enough, because of the arc flash, uh, because of the redundancy, uh, I think I would say especially because of the, the, the added redundancy and, and, the, and the reduced downtime, uh, it's very, very popular. Uh, if most data centers that I can think of that are larger uh, have high resistance ground. Um, and I don't think there's a reason, um, I don't, I just as a note, I don't think there's a reason why you can't use them at, at smaller data centers. Usually they're they're either less lesser manned or they're looking at reducing costs, which is I think why the main reason is you don't see them as much, but they're very, very, very popular in larger data centers. Um, significantly increases personnel safety, like I just mentioned, our flash reduction of 90, 95%. That's a big deal, especially when you have a, a data center of personnel staff that's kind of there a lot. Uh, you, if you can reduce the amount of arc flash by that amount, you know, one in twelve, or you know, by 95%, that's a huge, a huge say. And just as a, just uh, just to mention, you know, on average, your typical arc flash event costs about a million dollars, and it probably, I'm guessing, although I don't know this, I'm just guessing, it's probably greater than than uh, greater than average for data centers. Um, so. Just think about that way. I mean, it's also it's a good investment for, from that front as well. Um, proper component selection critical for maximum benefit for HRG. You know, just uh, elevated voltages. You need to worry about that. Uh, compatibility with EPS. Uh, you need to worry about that. Can your try to pick your components that that would offer or that would have less of, of a capacitive charge current contribution. And then challenges can be overcome with proper design. Kind of that kind of goes along with that as well. If you, if you use the right equipment with HRG, you should be fine. It's used all the time. Uh, you just need to be careful with it. Okay, we're going to, we're going on to Q and A. Uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and email me. Uh, I will, we will definitely get back to you. Um, you will receive an email with a link to a certificate. Uh, if you have uh, a need for a certificate for continuing education. That uh, that will should do it for you. We can also send you a PDF version of the presentation. Sometimes you need that uh, for you know, auditing purposes, or just if you want it, want a copy of it, or if you want a video copy, please uh, please let us know. We'll get one for you. Uh, and then uh, if there's any issues, 
Uh, these are kind of standardized certificates, and there's 50 different, uh, uh, you know, bodies of, I try, uh, you know, engineering, professional engineering states that uh, have different requirements. So if you happen to be that the wrong format for your state, then let me know. We'll we'll, we'll take care of for you. Now we're going to go to the, the Q and A portion. So let me know, Stu, if we have any questions. Well, in a, in a first for either go to webinar or my own personal experience, there are no um, presentation related questions. Wow, I either we either stunned you with so much information that you're, or we or we or, we, uh, or something else. I'm not sure. Well, I will I will say this: uh, if you guys if, if questions come up. Um, Please feel free uh, to email us and let us know uh, if, if you have anything related to, to data centers or any, any of the things we talk about. Um, and of course, always, if you have any questions at all about HRG or about LRG or about anything, um, feel free to contact us as well. I appreciate your time, guys. Uh, hopefully, this was this beneficial. Um, uh, you know, thanks again, and hopefully, we'll, we'll see you next time. I, just as a note, I think we're going to be probably resuming our next series at the beginning of the year. So so uh, keep uh, keep us in mind and look out for an email pot potentially for, for, for information on that. So thanks a lot, guys. Take care.